This lecture is by Dr. Alok Kumar Gupta. This is the seventh lecture in the Plato series or series of lectures on Plato. It is on theory of justice, which I am going to discuss now. In the last lecture, we have started how Plato slowly and gradually, after refuting the three theories of justice, proceeded towards building his ideal state, a state which he conceives into the realm of ideas, where justice prevails. So his ideal state is a state where justice prevails. So what is his theory of justice? Now, dai kai sume is the word. It is a Greek word which Plato has used for justice and which comes very near to the word morality or righteousness. So one can say that uh, the Greek word for justice has a broader connotation because it also includes in itself the meaning of or the, the, the element of morality and righteousness. So one should always remember that justice is the fundamental principle lying at the root of a well-ordered society. This is, this is a very simple sentence. I don't think I need to explain it. And uh, this is one of Plato's greatest contribution to social philosophy and also to political philosophy. So there could be a question, what is the Greek word for justice according to Plato's Republic? So this is the word the Kai Sume. Then his theory of justice also resembles preaching of Gita. Plato's justice bears a good deal of resemblance to Gita's dictum and that dictum is it is better to die while doing a duty assigned to oneself. On the other hand, it is dangerous to do a task which is assigned to somebody else. This statement of Gita comes very near to Plato's theory of justice where he means to say or rather he has established that justice prevails only when each of the three classes that he has enunciated for his ideal state performs the duties assigned to them or the duties for which they are best fitted at. So, uh, this statement of Gita says that it is better to die while doing a duty assigned to oneself. Means, one should only perform the duty which one is assigned and on the other hand, it is dangerous to do a job or a task or a duty assigned to somebody else. So, one should not perform the task of others and uh, it is better to die, this statement says, that rather than performing the task of others. So, Plato is not going that far, but he says that justice would prevail only when all the classes perform their duties for what, what they are best fitted at and if, if one encroaches into the task of the others, functions of the others, then the justice would be disturbed. So anyway, one can uh, draw a similarity between what Plato has preached and what is available to us according to the Indian traditions of knowledge in our own Gita. So according to Plato, justice prevails in the ideal state means performance of its functions by each class. And just as justice exists in the ideal state, it also exists in the individual's mind. So justice in the individual means the due performance of its functions by each element in human mind. So all the three elements that exist in human mind will perform their own functions, which means if gold is prominent in one and he is a man of gold, gold, he is fit to be a ruler. 
so he should perform only the task of a ruler this is what is the meaning of this sentence and if the element of silver is prominent in him or her he is fit to be a soldier so he should only perform the tasks of a soldier so, and accordingly so justice in individual means the due performance of its functions by each element in human mind if if reason spirit and appetite remains within their bounds there is justice in individual's mind plato realizes the sign of a sane mind is the proper coordination of these three elements so what it means is that if there is a proper proper coordination among these three elements in our, in human mind in our mind then we would be just individual would be just if one is a man of silver and tries to become a man of or tries to perform the task of a man of gold that is reason that is he is fit to be a soldier but is trying to be a ruler so under such circumstances he is contributing towards unmaking of the justice in the ideal state this is what is the meaning of plato so once again what i have discussed in our previous lecture by way of uh, the table uh, i am explaining here as well three part i division of human mind or soul so three metals gold silver iron bronze copper these are different uh the differences on account of different translations so <clears throat> these three metals represents three elements of human mind or soul reason spirit and appetite and <clears throat> these three elements of human mind or soul represents three virtues in human being reason leads to wisdom or knowledge spirit to courage appetite to temperance now these were the days when four cardinal virtues were doing the rounds were quite prominent in were in quite prominence during the ancient greek world or in the ancient greek world wisdom courage temperance and justice so wisdom courage and temperance the three top virtues he has assigned to three elements of human mind and the task of justice he says is the proper proper coordination among these three virtues or three elements so maybe we will be discussing later uh, about these four cardinal virtues but right now one should understand that the role of justice is to strike a coordination a balance among these th three virtues or three elements of human mind so correspondingly these three virtues leads to three different classes that is rulers wisdom leads to rulers courage to auxiliaries that is soldiers and temperance to producers or workers and somewhere you also find the mentions of peasants as third class so rulers who are philosophers auxiliaries who are soldiers producers workers or peasants these are the three classes now about the four virtues that i was just now talking about these are called four cardinal virtues wisdom courage temperance and justice cardinal comes comes from latin word cardo which means hinge hence all other virtues hinge on these four virtues means whatever other kinds of virtues which are in us they are dependent upon or they are hinged upon these four virtues that is wisdom courage temperance and justice so plato has first discussed the cardinal virtues in the republic and they entered into christian teaching by way of plato's disciple aristotle so what it means is that these four virtues were later on imported into the christian world by aristotle aristotle was the disciple of plato so in christian theology they are prudence justice fortitude and temperance so they are also they have the mention of four uh, virtues and but they are using different terminologies and different order that is prudence justice fortitude and temperance and they 
form a virtue theory of ethics. So this is just for your knowledge. And these virtues derive initially from Plato in Republic. He has discussed about it in book 4. Aristotle expounded them systematically in the Nicomachean Ethics. They were also recognized by the Stoics and Cicero, who has expanded them in their philosophy. Now, there are two aspects of justice according to Plato. So one uh, is the individual aspects of justice and the other is the social aspects of justice. So Plato has first discussed the social aspects after drawing conclusions from such discussion, he then discusses the individual aspects of justice. And we have already discussed in previous lectures that reason is Plato's theory of large letters. Okay. Now, Plato's justice is based on three principles of society. So, first principle is principle of functional specialization, which emanates from his theory of myth of metals, <clears throat> which I have already discussed in my previous lecture. Now, here he says, every individual must perform the function inside the state for which he is best suited. So, according to myth of metal theory, which Socrates has enunciated, every individual is born with either of the iron, silver or gold metal as the dominant metal in the make of his physical personality which I have already discussed. So, the station of one's life is determined by the presence of, presence and dominance of this metal. And accordingly, he is required to perform that function for which he is meant and best suitable. So, this is the theory of functional specialization that a man must perform only that function which is his destination of life. Which means, a man of gold should only be prepared to go to rubber, to rule or to govern a man of silver must be prepared and convinced only to fight in the battlefield and end up as a soldier whereas the men of iron are fit to become pageants or workers or producers so they should remain convinced that they are fit only for this task and they should continue to perform the task of producers. So this is what is the meaning of principle of functional specialization which is the first principle of justice according to Plato. So the analysis of the state shows that there are three necessary functions to be performed. The underlying physical needs must be supplied and the state must be protected and governed. The principle of specialization demands that essential services should be distinguished and it follows that there are three classes, the workers who produce, the guardians who in turn are divided though not so sharply into soldiers and the rulers or the philosopher king if he be a single ruler. So all these three classes should continue to perform their functions for which they are best fitted or which is best suited to them. So this uh, division of functions resets on difference of aptitude because some of us are men of gold, some of us are men of silver, some of us are men of iron. So the three classes depend upon the fact that there are three kinds of men, those who are fitted by nature to work but not to rule but only under the control and direction of others. And finally, those who are fit for the highest duties of his statesmanship, such as the final choice of means and ends. So these three aptitudes imply on the psychological state three vital powers of the soul. That which includes the appetitive or nutritive faculties, that which is executive or spirited, and that which knows or thinks that is the rational soul. So, whatever I have explained, the same things are being reproduced in different language. Second is the principle of non-interference, which means 
that one class must not interfere into the task of other class or other classes. This is a quote, it shall concentrate on its own sphere of duty and shall not meddle with the sphere of others. Which means the rulers must not try to become soldiers, soldiers must not try to become rulers. Producers must not try to become soldiers or rulers. Similarly, rulers must not try to become producers. So this is what is the meaning of principle of non-interference. And if this is followed only then and then only there can be unity in the state and the society as a whole can benefit by the work of the individuals. Which means he says if the principle of functional specialization and non-interference are followed in letter and spirit it will lead to greatest unity within the state. If one class interferes into the functions of the other class, it will disturb it will disturb the very unity of the state. So third principle is the principle of harmony. Human virtue according to Plato is divided into wisdom, courage, temperance and justice, the four cardinal virtues that we discussed earlier. The first three he has assigned to is assigned one to each class, which means uh, wisdom, courage and temperance are assigned to three different classes that is the rulers, soldiers and the producers. The fourth one is left. There remains justice. This is what he is saying. Now the task of justice is to harmonize the three virtues which means to strike a balance among the three virtues. The nature of justice is, according to Plato, is architectonic in relation to other excellences, which means it is related to them as the work of the architect or a master builder in the construction of a house is related to that of masons, joiners, wood carvers, and sculptures who work under his direction. So what it means is that the architect who has designed the building, he coordinates among the masons, joiners, wood carvers, sculptures and other who are involved into the building of the uh, <coughs> structure and architect coordinates the tasks of all these service providers. So all these masons, joiners, wood carvers and others are required to work under the direction of architect. Only then the building would come in a balanced way, the way he, the architect must have designed. So similarly, the role of justice is to bring harmony or to establish harmony among the three classes of rulers, auxiliaries and producers. This is the principle of harmony. So basically Plato's theory of justice is based on three principles. Principles of functional specialization, principle of non-interference and principle of harmony. So this is what one requires to keep in mind. Now critical appraisal. Obviously there are different criticisms of Plato's theory of justice. One is that it is not enforceable. Self-control and devotional self-abnegation in the interest of society lie at the base of Plato's justice. Which means each class is required to practice self-control, art of self-control and self-abnegation. Which means if I am uh, designated as a producer, then I should be convinced thoroughly that this is what I am fit for. So I should not try to become a ruler or a soldier. I am fit to be a producer, so I should continue as a producer. So uh, this is the base of Plato's justice. These are moral principles having no legal sanctions behind them, which means I am not interfering into the task of others. Out of my own morality, 
it is not that it has it has been made mandatory by law so plato justice does not visualize and provide for class of individual wills and conflicts between one interest and another so basically what it means is that the principle of non interference or functional specialization is very difficult to enforce because each one of us or this is human nature that we we think we are fit for more than one kind of job or task so uh, how far it is correct it is left to the readers whether these are enforceable or not on first enforceable second criticism is that it is not applicable in a modern nation state it is not applicable in modern nation state whose population runs into millions which means theory of functional specialization and non interference all these could be possible in smaller states this is this seems to be a valid criticism that in smaller states it could it it could be put into practice but in a, a larger modern state to the size of say india or china it is uh, well nigh impossible so it is not physically possible to divide such a large population in three stereotype classes and to assign to them fixed functions nevertheless i mean one can understand the underlying principle within the principle of functional specialization basically in modern nation state what it means what it would mean is that an engineer should continue to be an engineer should not try to become a businessman a doctor should continue to be a doctor should not try to become a businessman should not become too materialistic a teacher should tr- continue to be a teacher rather than think of becoming a businessman and mint money this is what is the underlying principle so uh, third criticism is that it reduces individual to one third of his personality because it tries to leave two third of the personality of the individual undeveloped which means if the individual possesses all the three elements reason spirit and appetite he should develop all these faculties but then later on we will learn that uh, plato's scheme of education is such that uh, initially it trains all the three elements but gradually at, as it tapers up his education system is more rigorous more specialized for the top classes so plato would confine one class of individuals to the development of one faculty only which means only those who show aptitude for a uh, region they are fit to they are men of gold and they are fit to be ruler so they should all they should alone be trained into the art of ruling this is what is the scheme of plato so if he belongs to the ruler's class he will develop regions only similarly if he belongs to the soldier class he will develop his spirit or courage alone and again if he belongs to the peasant's class he will develop the instinct of appetite this attitude amounts to reducing the individual to one third of his personality which means only one element is being focused upon and is being trained two other elements are being left aside fourth is absolute power to the ruler so plato's scheme of justice assigns absolute ruling power to one class that is the philosophers only so such kind of monopoly of political power in the hands of one class however well trained morally and spiritually is bound to demoralize the class sooner or later and thus corrupt the state because lord lord acton's statement becomes a little relevant over here that absolute power corrupts absolutely is a truism and it cannot be denied but uh, one may think that this is a subjective criticism depending upon what is the scale of appreciation in him for plato and plato's scheme of justice nevertheless this is also a criticism 
that assigning such an absolute power to one class will make them corrupt. Fifth, it leads to totalitarianism. So, uh, Karl Popper, earlier slides also, I think I have made a mention of it. In his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, criticized Plato's concept of justice most vehemently and on the ground that it leads to totalitarianism in contrast to humanitarianism, which means it allows the ruler class to control or dominate the total aspect of individual's life. This again, how far is a valid criticism is left to the reader. Crossman says, Plato's philosophy is the most savage and most profound attack upon liberal ideas which history can sow. So, going by this statement, one can easily make out that this is uh, most damaging criticism of Plato's theory of justice. Thank you very much. We now come to an end to lecture 7 in the Plato series. Bye-bye.